Um, so thank you. Right. So um, five minutes late, but uh, we're now starting. Thank you everyone for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to you wherever you are. Um, welcome to our panel on catalytic capital at the tipping point. Uh, and we'll be using this time today uh, to talk about why catalytic capital, uh, why now, and what we can do to advance this field. And for that, uh, you've already seen and heard from a little bit more of the panel than from me, but we had a great panel today. Uh, Anne Conacher from the Rockefeller Foundation, Chris Jurgens from Amidia Network, and Ermi Singhuta from the MacArthur Foundation. And, and together, these philanthropies have established the Catalytic Capital Consortium, or C3, as we call it, uh, an investment, learning, and market development initiative uh, that's been launched to encourage greater use of catalytic capital and greater impact from that use. Uh, in recent months, C3 has announced uh, some exciting investments uh, in the US, Latin America, Africa, and beyond. Uh, more information, if you need it, can be found on the MacArthur website. Um, and I think we could, uh, we'll post some of these links in, in the chat as we go along. Also, just last Friday, C3 launched its grant making program. Uh, based at New Venture Fund, which will focus on the learning and market development side of things. And we'll be speaking to this more as we go through the discussion today. Uh, I will add that my colleagues and I at FSG have been really uh, honored to have been working with the C3 partners to get some of these things going. Um, and it's been a privilege to help do something which is so important to not just impact investing, but actually to shaping the kind of world that we, we want and that we need. Um, so I'll start with um, defining catalytic capital, so we're all going into this on the same page. Um, I'll start with the, the textbook definition that really smart colleagues have spent a lot of time working on and thinking about, so I think that's always the safest place to start. And then I'll give you some of my own thoughts uh, about what it means. And so the, the definition comes from a report that came from Tideline and the MacArthur Foundation last year, defining catalytic capital as capital that expects disproportionate risk and or concessional return to generate positive impact and enable third-party investment that otherwise would not be possible. And I also like the way that our colleague Deborah Short from MacArthur describes it, that it is the but for capital that makes high impact transactions possible. It bridges gaps by being more patient, low return, more risk tolerant, or, or just unconventional in, in some way. So those are the characteristics of catalytic capital. But I think what we all really want to know is why, why is it important? Why would you do this? Um, and it's important because flexing these financial expectations essentially allows capital to push harder into many more impact areas, and usually into the places where it's most critically need it, right? Hard to reach populations and geographies, innovative solutions and models that don't exist yet. Situations with small transaction sizes or high transaction costs, right? So many of us will recognize that many of the areas with the greatest impact potential and the greatest need have these characteristics. So essentially what we would like, it enables us to do is to be more ambitious about impact and, and essentially that we can go further in shaping a world that is that is truly equitable and, and sustainable. And I'm sure that's what we're all here for today. But I also want to add um, that this is not just about accepting concessions. It's not just about these technical pieces. Um, I think it's actually about a mindset shift. I think it's saying, let's start with what is broken out there, deeply broken in many cases, and the solutions that are already there or being developed to help fix those problems, then let's understand what those solutions need to be as powerful as they can be and strive to provide them with what they need in the way that they need it. And adjusting our approach and expectations as needed. So that to me is really I think, in a nutshell, both the letter and the spirit of capitalistic capital. So with that, let me um, turn to my panel with essentially the same question. You know, what is capitalist capital? Why is it important? Um, and I might use as, a, as an organizing framework uh, something that is described in the Tideline report 
um, about the three roles of catalytic capital. Um, and to you, Chris, I might turn to you for the first role, which is about seeding, which the report describes as essentially the work of pioneering new models and markets, proving them out before, before others are ready to, to come in. So Chris, I'd love to hear about how this is played out in, in the work of Media Network. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining. It's good to see some familiar um, names and friends uh, on this call and some other um, catalytic capital leaders from, from the field. Um, Harvey, first of all, just, just echo your characterization up front and Omidia Network is so passionate about driving more catalytic capital impact investing because we think it's essential for the re field to, to reach its, its full potential and essential in this moment where we're living in, in particular. Um, you framed up this but for nature for, for reaching the populations that are hardest to reach, the, the places that are hard to reach, the innovations that need the most uh, patience to come to fruition. And then this notion of the context of seeding new innovations, scaling those that have promise and helping that scale pathway accelerate and sustaining things that need permanent catalytic capital in order to achieve the full depth of impact. Um, that's the, the, the three pieces of that, that timeline framework you mentioned. Omidyar well, Network has operated as an early stage venture capital. So our deployment of catalytic capital and why it's been so important to our mission has been that seeding context. Um, seeding new innovations uh, at the enterprise level, but seeding new markets, impact markets that have the potential to scale and that the potential for catalytic capital to not just seed an enterprise and a solution, but to build a market has been fundamental to our thesis. So for example, we were early investors way back in the day in, in D-Light and off-grid electric and the off-grid energy space before these were well built up markets that they are today, as we saw the potential not only for those individual innovations around um, household solar lantern and household rooftop solar systems, but the ability to catalyze a new market for off-grid solutions for those that live um, beyond, beyond the grid. So we've seen it be important in that context, that, that notion of market level impact is core. And I think a second context is really building out impact markets in those niche markets where um, mainstream capital isn't going um, or, or aren't as prominent on the global stage. So for example, we've been one of the few impact investors that have focused on pro property rights uh, as an impact uh, area and helping individuals, households secure property rights as a foundation of their economic well-being and looking for prof for profit solutions in that space. So we invested um, in a company called Suyo in Colombia that provides affordable uh, property formalization services to families, a very unproven business model that's trying to make this a profitable um, enterprise. Saw that as high risk, but high impact potential. We are a philanthropy, uh, uh, and so we, we, we have the ability to take that risk for, for impact purposes and, and see our role as seeding innovations acknowledging they may wildly succeed or fail, but then paving the way for others to come in and after us. So that's the main context in, in which we've seen it critical is that that seeding context. Uh, and I know you'll turn to my colleagues for some of the other deployments. Great, thank you, Chris. And I love that you mentioned both sectors that we've already heard about because they've been built out like off-grid energy and some that we haven't heard about yet, because you're still building them out like property rights. Thank you. Um, so to turn to the second role um, of Catalyst Capital, which is really about scaling, scaling, expanding models, and, and really sort of bringing in also this element of external capital, conventional capital to help scale them. Could I turn to you, Adam, and ask you to speak about that second role of Catalyst Capital from, from your experience? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, one thing I would just say as I go into this is, uh, you know, the foundations tend to play in all three areas in different in different programs, right? These are our three tools that we use in all, all instances. But just to focus to the scaling for a minute, because I think this is a really critical. Um, you know, often we're really good at launching things, and then we're not so good at seeing them through when they can work towards maturity and, and really, you know, stand on their own. And so, you know, we've looked at this in a number of different ways. How do we actually take some of our successes or, or some of the successes we're seeing in the field, and how do we move them forward? And how can our cap capital still be helpful in that part of the process? Um, and, there, and there's lots of examples I could give on this front as to what we do. Maybe I'll just point to a few. One is, you know, we're actually involved in, um, invested into 
uh, the latest leapfrog fund, for example, and, and they've gotten to a point where they can take in much bigger chunks of capital. Um, and the investment we made in this instance was to help them, um, if you will, uh, get over some of the risks that, that are uh, associated with the types of capital they're trying to take in. So they wanted, you know, OPEC basically involved, and, and OPEC is a fantastic partner who cut great checks, you know, large checks, um, but has limitations on how it fits into a capital st uh, stack. And those limitations can be very problematic for the other investors who sit alongside them. OPEC can't take equity like the other ones can. Um, and so they have to have, you know, specific protections in place. And so, you know, we sort of designed and, and, and targeted our investment to help pay for an insurance premium that would cover some of those protections specifically, right, in the event that, that those would actually need to be called, which is very unlikely. Um, but, but what I want to point out there is, is, you know, as we think about scaling now, it's, it's really about limiting the scope of the catalytic capital so that it's not covering everything, right? We didn't go in with a first loss tranche so that we were juicing returns for others. We went in and specifically said, what is the risk that happens at the next phase that we can start to uh, help them overcome, right? So that in the future, they're able to continue to take in larger and larger checks without inadvertently setting an expectation that, you know, we're going to create... Um, uh, credit enhanced positions, and that's the only way for these funds to move forward. So being very thoughtful about that whole process. Uh, maybe going back to Chris's point on off-grid energy, I mean, uh, Rockefeller has also worked for a very long time in the renewable energy space, in the microgrid, mini-grid space, um, and energy access space. Um, and, 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 you know, that's an area where I would say this is one where, as we think about the scaling challenges that occur and the reason why we still get involved and why we put ourselves into blended structures and things like that is, um, you know, part of this is it goes well above and beyond the mobilization of capital to capital, right? So in, in that effort, it's not so much just that we need more capital, we do, um, but it's also that the market's going to take time in terms of building to a, uh, a sufficient scale and, and, and robustness to be able to operate, right? You have to begin to pull through certain technologies. You have to begin to show demand at a certain level, um, and you have to be able to integrate, you know, um, basically the energy access component, the renewal, uh, or I'm sorry, the distributed decentralized um, energy into the national electrification plans. And those are things that don't just happen on their own. And so for us, it's a little bit of like, how do you kickstart, you know, a certain impacts position in another space so that it can scale along with the efforts that are already in place, the tens of billions that actually go into, you know, building out grids around the world. And so um, again, that's why, you know, we see ourselves putting in a lot of blended capital into spaces like that, because it's more about proving that the demand is there, pulling that demand through into a market that we think is ready to take these things on at more scale. So, I, I, again, you know, my point here would be that there's lots and lots of examples where I think, you know, foundations like ourselves need to go deeper on the scaling side. I think we could probably, you know, surface hundreds of these for you today and just like, this is where things tend to get sort of, um, either overthought and, or oversimplified, or they tend to be, you know, left behind. And I, I, re I really think scaling is a critical component of this, of what we use catalytic capital for. Thank you, Adam. And thank you also for speaking to the connection between catalytic capital and blended finance, which I know the term has already been, you know, coming up in, in the chat. So thank you. Um, Ermi, if I could turn to you now to speak to the, the third role, especially of Catalyst Capital, which is around sustaining. And I think, you know, this has been described as supporting, such a supporting model that needs some sort of ongoing subsidy of an ongoing sub-commercial returns profile. Could you speak to that, please? Sure, thank you. Very glad to be here and a big welcome to our, all our um, attendees at this panel. I think you've touched on sort of the cre uh, you know, critical role we see for catalytic capital and uh, one of the elements is in bringing in investors who can join simultaneously or subsequently. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the sustaining role in the context of MacArthur's work with CDFIs. Uh, as many of you know, the foundation has been providing support to CDFIs for several decades now. I think the um, total amount uh, that has been uh, uh, provided in loans and grants is in excess of about 250 million over the course of several uh, years. Um, and uh, there are two sort of roles here. One of them is indeed the sustaining one. One of them is sort of just in seeding the sector in the very early days, along with Ford and others. MacArthur took a lead in actually providing initial um, loans and grants to um, the early and older CDFIs, thereby demonstrating that they were credit worthy and providing room for um, other finance providers to come in down the road. And then on the sort of sustaining piece, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, CDFIs have a nonprofit structure, which means that um, they need essentially rely on mostly grant financing or uh, their own 
reserves in order to be able to create the equity equivalent for uh, being able to raise more uh, debt or loans from third parties. And uh, you know, foundations have over the years been able to provide this catalytic capital in the form of grants, also providing loans um, that are typically um, subordinate, um, longer term, uh, lower interest rates, all of which help CDFIs to then build up that uh, additional reserve they can from their uh, higher net interest margins also allow them, I think, to bring in more, um, more uh, senior debt from uh, uh, more conventional financial lenders. Just uh, two specific examples, uh, which will help you see these roles more clearly. One is the New York City acquisition um, um, fund that was set up, I think, in 2006. Uh, this was a blended structure. There were uh, private, philanthropic, and public actors in it, and about, I think, 40 million in a credit enhancement guaranteed uh, loans from a host of uh, financial institutions that amounted to 250 million. And what this money did was it provided uh, early stage financing for uh, real estate developers that were focused on affordable housing that had been typically a nonprofit structure and were unable to raise financing when they saw opportunities come up for acquisition of new of existing properties. And um, before permanent financing could be arranged. So that particular gap was uh, noted to be very specific and growing at the point in time when this was set up. And over the course of the years, this fund has been able to uh, on lend about, I think, 415 million in, in uh, financing uh, to these uh, real estate developers. So that's an example of something where there was an a particular need that the market was not being able to fill because it did not make a commercial sense. The second example of sort of sustained support uh, I would give is with self-help, which many of you know of. Um, it's, a, it's a very large uh, CDFI today. It was started in 1980 and it, focus, it focuses on particular communities that have been excluded from uh, creating wealth, um, through either home or business small or home or business ownership, and over the course of um, many years, Makatha has provided several loans and grants, um, exceeding what I think I would say 40, uh, 45 million or so. And um, you know, self have today has uh, is serving I think of individuals in hundreds of thousands, one hundred and fifty thousand is the number I had gotten, and has provided over seven billion in financing uh, to households and communities. So uh, this is sort of a demonstration of how uh, providing that sustaining support uh, to a very critical sector uh, can go a very long way in creating the impact and the change we want to see. Great, right. thank you, Omi. And, and I think that also underscores an important point, which is that actually in a given sector over time, catalyst capital can play in multiple roles which is something we should have said up front, but thank you for describing that. Um, so I might now turn to, you know, probably the crux of, of, of the topic that's in our title today, which is it, that it's at the tipping point. You know, why, why now for Catalyst Capital? Why, what do we mean by it being at a tipping point? Um, and for that question, I might turn to you, Chris. Um, you personally and, and a media network have been in this impact investing field for a long time um, and Owen's been a real leader in Casa de Capital. What's, what's different about this moment that we're in now? Thanks, Harvey. Uh, I think that's a question everyone on this call has been wrestling with every day of 2020. Um, but look, I think we've been doing a lot of thinking on the C3 team about what catalytic capital means in, in this moment. Um, I think in impact investing as catalytic investors, we often focus on this potential to seed and scale enterprises, solutions and markets that can generate positive outcomes as we just heard in the previous examples. And that is one set of core goals for individual impact investors and impact investing movement. What I think 2020 has made clear with COVID, with the ensuing economic crisis, with the reinvigorated efforts to combat structural racism, 
is that this is not enough and that we need to elevate our sites as a movement to the end goal of building a system of finance and investment that is purposefully inclusive and that itself contributes to a more just and equitable economy. Um, and our notion is that catalytic capital can make a meaningful contribution to this bolder end goal. It's, it's not the only thing we need to change in finance to make it happen, but it's part of it. I mean, at Omidia Network, we've taken our strategy up a level to this remit of reimagining capitalism, which is looking at a broader set of upstream issues around how the economic system and finance needs to change that require major changes in policy, in culture, in norms, and that fundamental ideas about we think about the purpose of the economy. And in that frame, we think part of that is more deeply integrating why conventional finance excludes or fails to reach some communities and what we want to do to respond to that structural failure to overcome barriers to access and biases inherent in, in how investment's done today. And I think why we think catalytic capital is part of that is the point you started at the, at the top, Harvey, on being oriented towards the impact, centering the impact and the beneficiaries that we're, we're all trying to reach at the end of, of the day. Because at its essence, catalytic capital is about being flexible, bending the strictures of traditional finance towards the needs and constraints of investees and, and beneficiaries we're trying to reach, that they themselves are trying to build more just and inclusive markets. And as you, you said, meeting more, them more where they, they are rather than starting with what are our constraints and investors. And so that's why we think catalytic capital is, is one ingredient that can help bend financial markets towards more just and inclusive outcomes. And to your point on the tipping point, I think one of the silver linings of what's otherwise been a devastating crisis has been seeing how impact as investors have responded to these crises. Um, for example, COVID by responding to their investees flexibly, um, providing bridge financing, providing actual uh, technical expertise on weathering the crisis, providing more patient and flexible terms. That is being catalytic in that it's being flexible and responding to the moment. Um, you look at examples of what the Open Road Alliance has done in mobilizing a rapid response fund for social enterprises to provide that bridge financing in the very weeks after COVID hit. Um, you look at what government has done or could do, right? Dedicated um, resources to CDFIs that Ermi talked about um, to provide essentially catalytic backstopping to enable CDFIs to um, deploy catalytic capital. We think there's even more they could do to intentionally target and earmark funds to minority depository institutions. So it's we're ensuring those resources. Um, reach the, the businesses and communities that are most needed that have been most impacted by, by COVID. Uh, and in the US, that's, that's communities of, of color and, and, and black communities in particular. And so I, I think those are signals of seeing how mainstream, uh, how catalytic capital is being um, deployed in ways we, we hadn't envisioned a year ago in this context of um, resilience and crisis response. And it's just another way we see this coming into um, not just being something on the side, but a core way we think need to think about um, impact investing going forward. Great, thank you, Chris. Lots of great thoughts there about about this moment, and I guess the drivers of this work both before and before 2020, and now you know in 2020, in this most unexpected year. Um, if I could now turn to the question of you know, what do we do, right? So hopefully by now we've all taken away Canada's capital. This is a great time and important time to be working on it. But for those of us who do want to engage on helping to build this field, what, you know, what are the things we should be paying attention to? What are the things that we could be doing? Um, and I'd love to hear from uh, all members of the panel. Um, Adam, if I could turn to you first. Um, you've encountered many of these barriers and challenges uh, you know, through the zero gap work, um, it would be great to hear about what you found and what needs to be worked on. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Harvey. I think um, may maybe just to take a segment of that question, because I think it's a much bigger question. And, and to be honest, you know, and, and all three panelists will talk of this, but I think this is something that we want to work on, right? This is sort of the work we, we task ourselves with and, and, and are trying to build a community around. But maybe just to take one segment of it, I mean, I think 
um, you know, if you think about sort of the barriers to, to use of catalytic capital, right, like the barriers to deployment and execution of that catalytic capital, um, and thinking about it really from the access side, you know, for me, it comes down to, you know, kind of the three things that we, that we talked about before. It's not enough catalytic capital. It's really hard to access. And when it's put into the field, it's oftentimes under leveraged. And so the question is, how do we really think about attacking, you know, attacking those three points? And, and do we have good examples of, um, you know, what we can do better or, or where we can go next? And I think, you know, even in my own portfolio, I'll just maybe highlight with some examples of where this plays out um, or, or some of these barriers are playing out. But again, I, you know, the overarching message isn't so much that, you know, this has been solved or that the Rockefeller Foundation can, you know, hand a guidebook down to everyone. It's, it's that this is the work to be done, right? Is that catalytic capital can play a very important role and, and we have to overcome some of these barriers. But, you know, on one hand, I think about sort of, um, you know, we, we have an example um, that's in our portfolio um, focused on, on sort of um, revenue-based financing and revenue-based investment in the United States. Um, and, and we've looked at this through the Capital Access Lab, which was done in partnership with um, Kauffman Foundation and through Impact Assets. Um, and, and we looked at that from a perspective of, you know, this is a powerful tool that we think can go much deeper. You know, this is a tool where um, <clears throat> we think there are emerging managers who are able to deploy this kind of funding in the United States to help small businesses get off the ground, to focus on them in a different way than venture capital would. Um, lots of good reasons to you know to look at this space and you know when we got started we, we kind of said you know the problem that they've got is that these are smaller managers and and the foundations are looking at it you know looking for right and and there's not really an ability to sort of build the field how do they actually access the capital that we actually do want to provide um albeit maybe in smaller chunks than we typically would and so um, you know, when we when we joined the Capital Access Lab, a big part of that, you know, effort was to find a way to seed lots of managers at smaller ticket sizes than we would normally um, be able to underwrite. And, and, and so it's like, it's, you know, sort of tools like this that I think where foundations can get more creative. I think, you know, another one that I really like, um, which I, I hope is in my portfolio at some point in the future, but, you know, there's a group called CNOTE that works on the CDFI front, you know, that Ermi was talking about. And, and if you've met CNO, you've seen a great story in terms of building the pipes to smaller CDFIs, helping all those smaller CDFIs access, you know, consistent capital over time. Um, and so, you know, in, in another instance, I also say, like, listen, this is a great example of, of where foundations can come in and, and help to backstop and support and grow a market where investors are wanting to get engaged um, and, and wanting to be involved there. Um, and so, you know, for me, again, it, it really comes down to there's lots of these barriers. I, I, I think that... Um, we can be smarter with how we deploy our catalytic capital. We can be clearer with how we deploy our catalytic capital. And in a lot of instances, you see partnerships like what's emerging on this, you know, on this stage right now, um, where foundations do want to come together and, and put out, you know, bigger chunks or, or more um, intentional chunks in, into big sectors. And so, um, you know, for me, it's an exciting time to think about more, you know, with more depth about how do we actually get past those barriers? How do we make catalytic capital easier for folks to to use and, and to use more efficiently and, and to use more quickly and, and those kinds of things? Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, Chris, could I turn to you for, for your thoughts on, on what's needed to really move the field? Sure. I mean, I think the building on Adam's comment, we're, we're trying to make it bring more investors in and help the existing partners get better and more effective at, at deploying catalytic capital. So on the first, I think we think part of it is, is providing just easier on ramps for investors of all different stripes from uh, family offices to foundations, to government actors, to development finance institutions um, to, to either get on the pathway or, or scale up their, their deployment of catalytic capital. One way, well, Medios tried to do that is, is share our own approach. And we put out across the returns a continuum a couple of years ago, which shared our, our our framework and methodology for thinking about when we consider catalytic capital and, and what conditions have to be, be in place for us to think that's the right approach versus either um, uh, a market rate investment or, or, or a grant. Uh, and we hope that framework uh, was useful for others and probably most useful for those similar to us, family office or, or a foundation that's doing early stage venture uh, investing. But we also recognize, you know, maybe less relevant for investors of different stripes. And that's one reason uh, the year after we worked on the Beyond Tradeoff series to um, share the approaches of eight different investors for how they manage risk return impact um, constraints uh, in their in their investing and their philosophies for when and where to deploy catalytic capital. And that ranged from 
early stage VC in emerging markets with the likes of Luck and Elevar to Ford as a major foundation to um, Prudential and, and Goldman Sachs on the, the mainstream side. And, and so we think getting those examples out there because every investor is, is different in their uh, in their their goals, their risk return priorities, their impact priorities, um, the, the asset classes they work in, and the more um, we think is shared about different investors' approach on the the when and the where and the why, the more useful that is for new investors to take that on board and adapt that to their context. And on the second piece, like helping practitioners get better, I think what we think is important, and I think what C3 thinks is important, is looking at catalytic capital in the context of specific asset classes uh, or impact contexts or, or sectors, and saying, how do we get more uh, effective about, and rigorous about catalytic capital in that context? And so here, I think there's great field building efforts going on in a range of domains. For example, I think the smallholder agriculture finance community has done a great job with organizations like the Council for Smallholder Agricultural Finance and ASELI, um, a, an alliance of a bunch of the big ag lenders to, to share their data and get much more rigorous around where catalytic capital is needed in agricultural lending, what additional impact that enables, what farmers that allows you to reach either further down the income scale or in harder geographies or in less well-organized value chains, and then really be able to go back to investors and say, this is the impact, this is why we need catalytic capital in a very specific impact context and make the case for it. Um, we've been proud to partner with others, including um, MacArthur on the Collaborative for Frontier Finance, which is again looking at catalytic capital in the context of uh, investing in small and growing businesses and emerging markets in the missing middle that are too big for microfinance, uh, don't have the growth expectations of traditional venture capital and too early stage for debt lending, and that needs some of the alternative financing instruments um, that Adam mentioned, like revenue-based finance or fund structures that allow longer time frames for, for exit or self-liquidating structures or flexible debt that uh, allow exit pathways in, in that regard. And here, I think we think, just like we need catalytic capital for pioneering enterprises, we need catalytic capital for pioneering financial intermediaries and fund managers. And so um, these great fund managers and, and emerging markets that are pioneering these new hybrid structures for SGB investing need investors that are risk um, tolerant and need a community that starts working on, okay, what are the right, what can we learn from the challenges and constraints of investing and the need for catalytic capital in that context? So see a lot of potential for, for collaboration at this kind of um, sector asset class sort of intersection. Great, thank you, Chris. And it's great to hear both you, Chris, and Adam speak to this idea. Um, of changing how money is flowed. I think there was this question that came up in the chat about um, not just flowing money to where it's needed, but how money is flowed and thinking about new um, instruments and new structures to do that. They'll actually match better to, to invest these uh, needs and constraints. Um, Ermi, could I turn to you now? Um, Ermi, you've really been at, you know, in the vanguard of helping to pull together the C3 program that's just been launched around knowledge and, and, and market building. Um, so we'd love to hear you speak more to that and, and just more broadly what is needed to build the field. Thank you, Harvey. Um, so yes, um, hopefully you've all seen in the ad request, Emily, I think she's put uh, the information in the chat as well. Uh, we've just launched the C3 grant making uh, program. This is housed at New Venture Fund. We thank you to New Venture Fund for working with us on this. Um, and we're inviting proposals uh, for uh, research essentially uh, strengthening the evidence base. I'm going to take a step back and, and tell you a little bit about where and how and why we landed here. Um, so I think um, over the course of the last year and a half, we've had extensive conversations uh, working with uh, different uh, consulting partners with investors to understand where the barriers were in their being able to deploy uh, more catalytic capital and do so more effectively. And, uh, and this grant making program really hopes to bring forward some knowledge and tools that can equip uh, these investors to do both those things, you know, enter the field and do so efficiently and effectively and uh, thereby hoping to significantly increase the amount of catalytic capital available and in use 
are in the field. Um, the gaps that we saw were really to do with uh, understanding what the role is, when is catalytic capital being used, and I see some of this flowing in the questions in the chat as well. When do you use it? Uh, where has it been used so far? Why has it been used? What is the kind of subsidy uh, that is needed? What are the structures that are used? Who are the other investors in the picture? Um, and so that a lot of it talks to sort of the how and the transaction uh, design piece. Also, um, again, uh, comments in the chat, and hopefully we can come back to this in the discussion in a bit. Uh, the question of when is it needed? When is it creating um, negative externalities that you should be worried about? Where are you? Um, and doing something that is not needed and not uh, required uh, for catalytic capital to be involved in. And uh, we hope to uh, actually answer some of these questions by looking at uh, examples and transactions that have already happened over the course of the last several mm -hmm. years uh, through this uh, research uh, program. And I think that what will really help investors is to be able to see more structure, evidence, and um, clear frameworks around thinking about when and how to deploy catalytic capital. Um, you know, as we've all said, it's very scarce. It plays a very significant role in terms of being able to bring more private financing to the table, right? Either simultaneously in a blended structure, so down the road by by demonstrating uh, viable models and allowing enterprises to scale in a significant way. So I, I think the question here is really for us to figure out. Uh, how best to support investors, and we hope uh, to really engage and learn from investors through this work. Uh, in addition to the research grants that we've just um, announced, uh, we would be looking at uh, two, three other elements that we hope will help uh, further these uh, goals. One is we will be uh, working with practitioners on tools and specific frames, uh, Chris referred to this a little bit, uh, in the context of different sectors, uh, themes, and asset classes to think about where um, catalytic capital specific tools and frameworks may be useful to them. And in addition to that, we are also hoping to partner with some of the networks that have different investor groups where we know catalytic capital is provided, you know, a, a significant amount of it comes from the public agencies, some of it comes also from the foundations and family offices. And um, we hope to really engage with uh, the different groups that uh, are talking to these uh, investor communities and be able to both, uh, I think, learn from what they have been doing and help them get access uh, to the right kind of uh, knowledge um, and resources that might further their own, uh, own uh, aims and their participation in catalytic capital provision. So with that, I hand back to Harvey and looking forward to uh, digging into some of the questions we saw. Great, thank you so much, Omi. Um, and I will say also that um, coming out of the work that um, I and colleagues have been doing with the C3 partners, uh, we also put out an article in SSIR that came out on Monday, um, which touches on many of these points about trying to really address uh, what investors need to know to help them move forward and I will just post that in the session chat now um, and so thank you for all your questions I've been following them with great interest I think some of them have been picked up as we've gone through the discussion um, I might sort of pull some of them together and, 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 and put to the panel something of a there is a sort of big and maybe slightly philosophical question here um, I've seen a few comments saying well, it isn't Canada Capital what impact investing uh, should be anyway? Um, you know, is there a way to reposition it as, as sort of the core? I think there was also a question about um, is there a tension in terms of how we use Canada Capital to engage conventional investing, which is taking a very extractive, which is very extractive. Um, you know, are we essentially subsidizing a very extractive mode of investing? Should we not be trying to push towards a sort of reinvention or reshaping? I think there was also another question about, is this a moment or a way of actually trying to reshape our whole paradigm of what investing is, of what capital is, of what finance is? 
So I think these are quite large questions, and I love that people are, are pushing there, and it very much lines up with all the conversations I've heard over the past couple of days. I'd, I'd love people to weigh in on that. Um, great there. Yeah. Big and great questions, Harvey, on, you know, is this all of impact investing? Should it all impact investing be, be catalytic? I, I mean, I think this catalytic capital is essential to achieving um, impact in, in, in many sectors and, and many contexts. Um, and I we, we've talked a lot uh, about how the, the need for market segmentation and map out the roles that different types of capital play in different contexts. And uh, many of the on the call are probably familiar with the uh, impact management project um, and their uh, kind of investors impact matrix, which maps out kind of types of impact and what importantly, what contribution investors can make to that impact. One of which is providing flexible capital. That's an active contribution the investor can make to the end impact. Uh, another is engaging actively um, with those in, in investees. Um, and so I, I, I think um, it's just a useful framework. We're seeing where catalytic capital plays versus other parts of the broader impact investing and ESG movements, which I think are also important to that end goal of transforming how finance works, right? If we want to transform the whole financial system, we also need the ESG players uh, and fiduciaries that are constrained by fiduciary duty to investing at market rate returns to also be pushing, to be activist investors that push corporates on their ESG behaviors. And so uh, I think it's different different roles for different kinds of, uh, of investors and the importance is having a frame for how they all fit together. Um, and then on that role of, of you know, is catalytic capital subsidizing commercial investment, could it lead to extractive behaviors? Um, this is where I think that, that combination of providing flexible cap capital and being an active investor as part of one's investor contribution is really important. So if, if you're funding in a blended capital stack into an enterprise, which now commercial VCs or private equity is coming into, is there a way to maintain a seat on the board and an active voice to be that kind of voice for impact uh, and ensure the enterprise and its management can stay centered on that and managing those those tensions. But I, I think it's it's clearly a tension as you move from seeding to scaling pathways and blends of investors with different motivations. Um, but but what I point to is that 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 value of of, of active engagement um, and and voice with um, with investees and, and, and boards and other structures where where you can have those conversations. Maybe just one, a couple of things to add, I guess, um, from my own end. Um, one, I love the philosophical questions as well, and I find myself on a very personal level as one who thinks, I think it's great, we should push for huge market transformation, right? Like big shifts in the way we think. Um, uh, but then I also recognize, you know, the reality is these things move over time and, and um, you know, norms are set not just by a foundation creating a project, but by, you know, actors acting differently and being inspired by projects differently and things like that. Um, but one of the things I want to say with the kind of of capital and, and the role it plays in here is, you know, there's sort of, there's always been a role for catalytic capital in the markets throughout all time, right? Different variations, maybe not called catalytic capital, maybe it's a public sector subsidy we're talking about, maybe it's, you know, early stage investments. I'm thinking back to like, you know, Benjamin Franklin has, a, he leaves money to the cities to create, you know, zero interest loan funds for small businesses and artists. Like there's been a role for sort of kickstarting markets in many different circumstances. And I think what we're trying to do here is really sort of highlight that role and get better at that role and see how that role might guide the markets in the future in a more intentional way than perhaps it has in the past, right? Let's study it more than we've done. Um, and so that's why I think it's, it's not so much that, you know, um, it's this line between are we, you know, are we just subsidizing the markets or are we, you know, not accepting, you know, that the markets need bigger transformation. I actually think we're, we're trying to fight both of those things. We do want bigger transformation, um, but we do think catalytic capital has always played a very, or I, I, I think catalytic capital has always played a very important role for many different actors. And there's a chance here to be a little bit more intentional and a little bit more thoughtful about it. Um, I also think that it goes well beyond this idea of just purely subsidy. And this goes back to my example about awkward energy. But a lot of what we're trying to do is just say, you know, these markets need they need a jump start. They need someone to just, you know, set up a technology fund that's going to help pull through certain battery technologies or, or create demand 
you know, um, clarity so that the, you know, that others can build 20 year business plans around uh, understanding what's going to be sold in the future and things like that. You know, I think one example, we, we invested in a group called, and, and it's a project that I, I really, really love and it's close to my heart. It's called um, Six Up and they're focused on, you know, sort of challenging, um, challenging the, the basics of credit scores for 18 year olds as they try to get access to student loans, right? And, and that's always been the model. And I actually don't even like that model, right? I think that we can probably rethink that model a lot, but but at a bare minimum, that model doesn't serve our population evenly. It serves people who either have parents who can guarantee that credit score or have somehow at 18 years old built themselves a credit score already. Um, so basically it serves the, you know, the highest ends and, and they're trying to say actually, a student's potential has nothing to do with that. It has more to do with who that student is and where they're getting access to go to college and things like that. And, um, and you know, so that's one where they've gotten access to some capital. They've got that fund up and running. They're, you know, they're not without their challenges of being a new business, but when we come in is we come in to say, not so much that we want to subsidize others, but we want to make sure that when you test that thesis, right, that all students are the same, that you go as deep as possible on testing it. And so, you know, there's going to be a limit as to where commercial capital will go. They might be willing to give up on the FICO score slightly. They might be willing to bend it slightly, but they're not going to go all the way. And, and our job is to say, if you're going to test it, let's test it all the way down. Let's look at all the students that aren't being served. Um, and so we come in and really pick up the loans that aren't quite able to make it into the broader community fund. And I think sometimes that's more of an example of what I like is it's sort of stretching finance, right? If you're going to test and you're going to upend some, some you know, deeply held assumption, then let's fully test it. And, and so I think there's a lot of examples as to, you know, my own philosophical, what is Catalina Capital? How has it been used and, and what can we do with it? But I think more sophistication and more creativity are really helpful. Domi, did you want to come in there? Um, I, I feel like a lot said, but, but two, two quick, very quick comments. One, I think, all of this uh, is interesting and I think highly, highly relevant. This makes me uh, think back to the sort of basic uh, fundamentals, right? So uh, I think, Harvey, you touched on it. The question is sort of what is the underlying situation, condition, gap that is creating the need for you know, non-conventional, non-commercial money? And, and that will essentially tell you where the role is and where the market or the you know the capital markets are sort of not being able to meet the need given given their structure so i think sort of identifying the need and responding to that need and I, the second thing i would say is being very clear about the intention and purpose of providing that money one is obviously you're meeting that need at the face of it right but to what end what end goal do we have what impact do we want to see and staying true to that through the process you know this is not about sort of providing money in where it seems like it's, it's this very heroic nice thing to do and not being able to track down the road um, what it resulted in which sorts of factors came in and and the reality is that uh, you know, if you think about the SDG financing gap, we need uh, private capital at the table, right? If we want to make any sort of dent in that, we want to bring more actors in. And so thinking about the spectrum and thinking about ways to both incentivize and engage uh, other actors up and down the spectrum, I think is critical to the success of uh, catalytic capital and the goals it hopes to achieve. Right. Thank you, Amy, and thank you all of you. I think uh, you you stepped up the plate on on a very big and 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 thorny question. Um, and I think just to add, you know, my own thoughts to that, I think what we're proposing here is very much. Uh, I think someone who's actually in the session, I won't say who because I'm not sure I'm at liberty to share, but someone said to me, um, you know, it, as we're waiting for this entire system to be transformed and for capitalism to be reinvented, what do we do? You know, are we going to press ahead and actually try to meet some of these urgent needs or are we not? And I guess what we have here is really an urgent call to act in the ways that we can with the players that we have around the table. Um, you know, and that doesn't stop us being more ambitious about how we think the whole system uh, can be improved. Um, I think there are some more practical questions here about, you know, how do we actually move into doing this? So uh, there was a question about foundations. Uh, you know, how do foundations really move into this and, and set up the right structures to channel funds? How do foundations think about combining grants with capital capital and what's that intersection? Um, and, and any other sort of structural barriers that might be there? Uh, I think this is in relation to fiduciary duty, but also other structural barriers for other kinds of investors. 
and I wonder in, in the, the few couple of minutes that we've got left, if anyone wants to opine on, you know, some of those practicalities um, that may be barriers for foundations or other kinds of investors moving in. I can take a very quick shot and I'm sure the others have uh, views. And so I would say, yes, you know, the set of questions came up extensively as we looked at the barriers um, to the use of catalytic capital in the field. Um, you know, knowledge on sort of one end, but sort of once you have the knowledge in hand, you are, let's say, a convert and you're ready to deploy what holds you back. And that really varies from group to group, but uh, in general, sort of having expertise and the knowledge at hand is hard. Um, as most of you know, capital, capital transactions and blended finance transactions tend to be very bespoke, very complicated, expensive. Uh, so, you know, smaller, newer actors find it very hard to get in. And, and there are some sort of, I think, novel actors that are coming in that are trying to address this. Um, there are also platforms that try to provide some of this information in a more, in a more cost-effective way. So I, I think the how is, is really tough um, and varies. We've seen uh, different solutions work for different folks. There's, uh, you know, and we're hoping as we start working with uh, industry networks that groups and groups of investors, we'll be able to come up with some more concrete uh, solutions that can help uh, address these uh, structural barriers. Maybe just to follow on, um, just to continue, I mean, I'll go quicker because I know we're running out of time, but you know, once I, I think that a lot of these actors are doing catalytic capital, right? Like this is actually part of what's happening. And so part of it for me is like, you know, when we think about it, for example, and, and you know, this is maybe the Rockefeller side, but I think it's also built into a lot of you know, the, some of the C3 thinking. It's like, it's who are you mobilizing and why and how, right? And do we have the right players mobilized? And have we thought about what a handoff to those, strat you know, those players look like? And it's just being a little bit more thoughtful about the role you're actually going to be playing and what sort of negative externalities might be created by that role, but or but more importantly, probably what positive externalities have you missed by not being a little bit more intentional or thoughtful in the way you've approached it. So, you know, I, I tend to think that a lot of this is happening. I, I think that we can learn from each other and, and you know, that's a big goal of the C3 initiative here, right, is to share more stories and, and to write up more case studies and let people know why we're focusing the way we're focusing. Um, I also want to go real quick just to the chat question. If I could take my, like, I'm already speaking privilege here for the moment, but I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions about um, DAFs and, and what role DAFs are going to play. And we've looked at this for, for you know, I, I would say my own my own career, two years now, we've been spending really studying three years, maybe DAFs. And we've got a few partnerships in place with various folks to really think about what role DAFs can play. Um, and, and, and the thing that, that has always struck me is twofold. One is, I think that we always assume DAFs are catalytic capital um, or that they're impact investment or that they're you know, very different from the rest of the financial community. And, and one reality that I personally subscribe to is that that's just not the case. Most of the DAF money is not thought of from an impact perspective. It's, it's, it's a tax planning perspective. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just to say that it's not this, you know, tens of billions of dollars of, of money that's sitting out there. That being said, I think there's a lot of really motivated money in there still, right? The premise isn't completely wrong. And, and so, you know, we've looked at it and I think there's some really creative things. I think Impact Assets does some great work. I think CapShift, thinking about the role of recoverable grants is fantastic and how do folks get involved because that's a total game changer for some of the bigger DAFs. Um, we've looked at some of the community foundations and, and, you know, how can we get them engaged on issues that are very, very central to their own communities, right? Where you might actually be able to mobilize the impact segment of, of a DAF that maybe or maybe is not as, as central to the way they think. So I, I do think DAFs have an enormous role to play. And the only thing I would, like I said, caution is, you know, it's not inherent that because they're a donor advised fund that they are in fact impact investors. In fact, the vast majority of them don't view that view it through that lens. So we just need to be a little careful about what the expectations are. Great, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, I think we've only got a few seconds left, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, and I, the final thing I'll say uh, is that you know, really, this is an invitation to all of you, all of us to really help build this. Someone made the comment in the chat that actually a lot of stuff that we talk about at SOCAP is catalytic or requires catalytic capital. I think that's right. You know, this is the crowd, I hope, that really cares about this and wants to build this going forward. So I really would commend to you all the resources and uh, thinking and work that's been mentioned today. I'm going to try to paste all the links, um, including some new ones that have been mentioned today. 
um, do look at them and, and, and really encourage you to, you know, have a really good think about what you can do to play your part to take this forward. So thank you all for joining us today from wherever you are in the world. Apologies again for starting a few minutes late, but I hope that was useful for all of you. And thank you to our panel for sharing your thoughts today and, and for your leadership. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you. Thank right. you. Have a good SoCal, everyone. Bye-bye.